Welcome to Deal Talk. I'm Michael Marzak, and on today's show, I'm sitting down with Michael Serpilla, CEO of Society Brands, to talk about the deal he put together to raise $204 million to fuel acquisitions for the e-commerce aggregator that he co-founded with his brother, Justin. Michael, welcome to Deal Talk. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm, I'm happy to be here and love everything that you're doing at Deal Talk as well as uh, deal makers in general. Well, thank you. Uh, before we jump into the deal that you put together, uh, give us a little background on Society Brands, what it does, who's involved, and, and how you came up with the idea in the first place. Yeah, sounds good. So uh, Society Brands is a tech-enabled consumer products company where we're doing a roll-up in the e-commerce space. So kind of think of us as an um, e-commerce version of Procter & Gamble. Um, we essentially are a house of brands we acquire, uh, acquire consumer product brands that specialize on either Amazon or, or their own direct consumer website. Um, there's obviously millions of third party sellers on Amazon and there's millions of um, brands that use the Shopify platform. So what Society Brands does is we acquire those brands and we find that a lot of those entrepreneurs are youthful in nature from the perspective that they're not looking to retire sometime soon. So since that's the case, um, we actually like to keep the founders on board. So we actually ask post acquisition, they get to enjoy liquidity, we acquire 100% of the company. But we ask for the founder to stay on board for a few years, and be part of our culture, our community, our ecosystem of founders that essentially um, are part of the society. We oftentimes say if a business mastermind, and an aggregator were to have a baby that would equal society brands because we are very much an acquirer of e-commerce brands, but we like to build a culture and a community or a society of entrepreneurs. So that's that's really what we're doing. We also offer the sellers rollover equity into society brands. So um, eventually down the line, when we have a liquidity event, uh, they get to enjoy a second exit for themselves as well. Oh, great. So, so let's talk about your deal because it, it's a, kind of a different way of, of going about uh, starting a business and, and funding a business. So you raised a little more than $200 million in equity and debt capital with uh, uh, the I-80 group. Uh, that's a huge raise for, for, for any company. So uh, let alone one as, as young as society brands at the time. So did you set out to raise that much capital? So, so, so yes and no. Um, so, so yes, we wanted it to be a large raise. Um, we were looking to raise at least a hundred million dollars. And we were really fortunate to partner with an incredible investment banker, uh, Senna Hill um, out of New York, and, um, and, and they ran a process. And we talked to uh, many alternative lending funds and growth equity funds. And we had several offers for around the $100 million range. And IAD Group um, ended up offering us $200 million of capital. And they were an incredible culture fits, the terms were fair, um, and we just really, um, from the very first call that we had with them, we felt a really good connection with them outside of the uh, fundraising side of things. So I'm a big believer in relationships. I'm a big believer in, you know, if you're going to partner somebody with somebody on the equity or the debt side, you really need to um, be able to feel like there's a good culture fit there. And we certainly had that with the I-80 group. So, so yes, we certainly were looking for a very large raise. Um, but uh, $200 million was certainly uh, more than initially what we were looking for. And, uh, but we, you know, doing a roll up, you know, you, you always need more capital, right? So $200 million was obviously a great number for us. And we were really, really fortunate uh, to be able to partner with I-80 on that. So did you uh, set out, you know, looking for an investment banker in Miami? I mean, how did you, you start that, that process? Um, or did you go to loan for a little bit and then decide to go with the investment banker route? Yes. So we went at it alone um, for a little bit. Uh, you know, kind of what, what I've found is uh, me and, and the rest of our team, we're really good operators, right? We, we've got a ton of e-commerce experience. Collectively, uh, our team has sold over $2 billion of products on e-commerce, but we've also performed two M&A roll-ups in separate industries. So we've got a lot of experience in the, the two core competencies that in order to execute successfully on what Society Brands is doing, need to have e-commerce expertise and M&A expertise. So those are really our lanes. Uh, capital raising, uh, and this is the same for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's not necessarily what you do, right? And how to run a process. We're operators, we're executors. 
And I think that we do a good job of raising capital as well, but investment bankers really spend their careers doing this, right? So like, even though they're, um, you know, hiring a banker costs money, I would encourage people to not look at it that way, because I think that a good banker really pays for themselves. And, uh, and that's certainly what we found with Senna Hill. And we tried it a little bit on our own, but we would always get a little bit distracted with the fact that we're operating a business and, and trying to scale our business, right? So hiring a banker is, is certainly, I think, a smart thing for uh, many entrepreneurs to do. So, so how, how long did that whole process take, um, even counting in the part where you were, you were going it alone? And then um, how, how did you finally settle on, on Senate as, and how many investment bankers did you talk to? So we, we certainly talked to several investment banks. Um, as far as the overall process, it was it was a few month process. Uh, you know, really the first process uh, is is getting all your data ready, um, putting together a data room, right? So if, if you're looking to raise money, uh, you need to have a really strong data room in place to where after capital providers sign an NDA, um, you can essentially share that information. And and, um, and and so that was really the first process. And then the next one was obviously speaking to, to many capital providers. So I would say collectively from start to, to finish, it's a several month process. It probably took us three or four months. Mm-hmm. And, and what was it about IAD that, that appealed to you um, to be your financial partner? So I, I just remember the very first call that we had with IAD. Um, I remember the, the contacts that we have at the IAD group. It just, we were on a, we were on a zoom and it just felt right. Um, and by the way, we didn't even talk about any numbers or like how much they would be looking to invest and things like that. At that point, uh, there was a general ask, but, but we really didn't talk about that so much. It just felt like a good culture fit. And I feel like one thing that, you know, maybe I have a talent with is having a good gut feeling about people and, um, I remember getting off of the Zoom and calling our investment banker and had a few of our team members. And I said, I, I think that this could be um, our capital provider. And and um, and it was very early to say that, but I really, really felt good about it. Um, there needs to be mutual trust. And and also they were um, willing to be patient with us too. You, you know, they, they knew that we had several interested parties. So I think that uh, they, they understood that and they were willing to be patient, but it always kind of went back to I-80 for us. Um, it, it was always it, it was always the one that uh, seemed to make the most sense. And, and they've been an incredible partner uh, ever since. So, um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, it just kind of dawned on me, right? I mean, you, you started the business in 2020, right? So, right, we're, we're already into the pandemic or soon into the pandemic. Did you go through the entire process virtually, or did you ultimately get to the point where you're doing some face-to-face meetings? Yeah. So, well, at this time, so society brands, technically when we had an EIN number, so to speak, <laughs> um, was October of 2020. Um, and, and we launched society brands because we saw, you know, brick and mortar, obviously COVID shut down a lot of brick and mortar retail shops. And I just simply asked myself, I was like, um, is there going to be more or less products bought online 10 years from now than what there is today? I think that the answer that I came up with was a smart one. I, I believe that there's going to be more products bought online 10 years from now than what there is today. So I, I knew the next phase in my career was to do a consolidation. I've had, I've been really fortunate with a um, successful career um, so far. And, and I, I knew that m a was always something that really intrigued me and my brother justin has a lot of experience in m a so it was really just a good fit there and um and looked at the e-commerce space and saw that there was millions of these third-party sellers on on amazon and millions on shopify and obviously as you know michael whenever there's any sort of consolidation there has to be fragmentation in a given industry uh justin previously was the head of M&A of a very large PEO. And in that PEO market, there was, I want to say 700 possible acquisition targets. And, um, and in this space, there's literally millions of acquisition targets. So it was really a, a perfect 
uh, industry. There could be multiple winners in the industry because there's literally millions of these third party sellers on Amazon and other e-commerce marketplaces. So it was really it was really a good timing for us uh, to get launched. How we launched Michael was a little bit different than how most other consolidators launch. Uh, most of the, most of the time you raise capital first and then you essentially run a process to uh, to find acquisition targets. With society brands, it was very different. We actually started off sharing our story to the marketplace and we ended up talking to sellers like here's what the society is. Here's what society brands is. You sell your business to us. You stay on board. We're not trying to kick you out of your own business. And we're working on proprietary deals that we were finding off market. And therefore, they weren't really in a hurry to sell their business anyway. So since that's the case, we uh, essentially talked to enough sellers and there was a ton of interest around um, selling their business to us in the fashion that we were doing it, offering them cash, um, liquidity, but also having them stay on board as the founder and be a brand president inside society brands. But then also, we are a sharing type of a company. Like, um, I'm certainly not the only shareholder at Society Brands. Um, I'm really proud to say that a, a lot of our team members hold uh, equity in Society Brands. And given that kind of sharing mentality, uh, we also wanted to do that with our uh, sellers as well. And we offered them rollover equity into Society Brands Topco. As you know, Michael, that's a very expensive deal term. It's a very lucrative deal term for them especially with an early stage company like Society Brands, um, where we're going over the next three to five years is going to be really, really incredible. And, and um, you know, you kind of talk to some capital providers and they look at that as a very expensive deal term. We were really fortunate to find capital providers that really believed in what we were doing. And we're building this thing from the ground up with our founders staying on board. I think a benefit there, Michael, is having that tribal knowledge um, that founder that's already grown it to, let's call it a $10 million a year revenue business. They're growing 30% CAGR. They've already done a really good job, right? Like, can we add skill sets and expertise on bringing uh, their brand omni channel and new product development, and various other ways, in, uh, um, perfect their, uh, their creative content? Sure, we can do all those things, but we don't have the tribal knowledge. We didn't build that brown from the ground up. Having that founder stay on board, um, you know, has kind of created stability for a business where when oftentimes in a roll up post acquisition, the business kind of goes trends down for a little bit. And then hopefully um, the M&A roll up company uh, turns it around with us. It's actually a, a gradual, uh, consistent increase because we're keeping that founder, those founding team members on board. So. That's kind of how we got started is, is thinking of like, okay, we could build something really, really big here, but let's, let's do it with the founders and create a win-win scenario. So um, I'm interested in, in what you can tell us about the structure of the deal because, you know, and it sounds to me like this, this approach of, of bringing, bringing the, the sellers that you're acquiring in as, as equity partners in the business worked out as far as that that deal structure that you you struck with i80 but um you know what can you tell us about how how your that capital is set up and and how you're able to deploy it um, in these acquisitions yeah so so what i what i can say about how our capital is set up is it's a combination of debt and equity uh, and a decent amount of it is debt um when when you're doing a roll up and you're buying uh, cash flow generating businesses. Um, it makes a lot of sense to use leverage. And um, in a large portion of the $200 million is, is debt. But we do have a very strong amount of, of equity in the business as well. So trying to find that balance between the two is, is always something um, when you're in my shoes or anybody that's doing a roll up, you're always trying to find the balance between the two. But I, I think that we did find a good balance and um, a large portion of it is debt, but we have a healthy amount of equity in the business as well. Is there anything in particular about um, uh, these, these third party sellers as a roll up that's that's different than than the typical roll up? You mentioned your brother had done done some some roll up type acquisitions. Is it a different different beast in any way? 
Yeah. So I, I, I definitely think it is, um, you know, when you're, when you're, um, doing a roll up in the PEO space or a lot of other spaces, integration is very, very, very difficult. Um, and I'm not necessarily saying PEOs, but just generally roll ups to actually integrate brands into your operating infrastructure is very tough in the e-commerce space. It's actually not as difficult. Um, e-commerce businesses, um, if, if you've created a moat for yourself, and especially on Amazon, um, there's two things that you need to have to be really, really successful on Amazon. One is an incredible brand that the consumers love um, and that gets a ton of positive reviews, thousands of reviews, an average product rating of four and a half stars or close to five stars. Um, if you have a brand that's been uh, uh, something that consumers love, then the Amazon algorithm rewards that seller um, up at the top of the SEO algorithm. So when you type in coffee mugs or whatever you want to buy on Amazon, uh, Amazon does such an incredible job of um, adding a level of transparency for their customers. They're obsessed with their customer experience. Um, and given that, uh, they like to see the sellers that are the brands that uh, have the best product ratings and the highest uh, number of positive reviews up at the top of that SEO ranking. The benefit for somebody like Society Brands is that that brand has created a moat for themselves. And that moat is very, very hard to, to overcome. Um, and that kind of brings me to my second point is it's not only having a good brand, you need to be on the Amazon platform long enough. Uh, our average brand um, that we look to acquire has been on Amazon for over 10 years mm -hmm. is the average. We certainly would be willing to look at something where, where they're not mm -hmm. on as long as 10 years. But if you think of how long that is in the e-commerce space, it's like a dinosaur, right? Like it's, it's a very long time for, for an e-commerce brand uh, to be in. So with that, they've been able to collect enough positive ratings and reviews. So um, it creates a little bit more of a moat uh, from, from that perspective. We like to call it a review moat, um, but that's on the Amazon side. And, and also I think that another thing that's really, really interesting about um, just e-commerce in general is uh, you could really create a predictable revenue stream that once you're paying for advertising, you could have a predictable outcome on what your return is going to be on that ad spend. I think that that's very unique as well. Last thing is just a really efficient revenue. Um, having uh, having um, as much revenue, as much profitability, um, but um, you know, having uh, as, as few of team members as reasonably possible to be able to produce that revenue is something that's really, really attractive as well. Thanks. Uh, you know, going back to, to putting together the, the deal, um, how long did that actual process take, take place? And, uh, and you know, what was the, the back and forth in terms of trying to get at that, that balance between the debt and the equity piece? So uh, as far as how long it took um, to put the, the deal together, I would say um, a couple months. Um, it, it just depends on when, when, when the start of it was uh, that, that we're talking about here on in this session, if it's when we signed a term sheet or if it's prior to that. But, yeah, from the but, term sheet. Yeah, so from the term sheet, um, it, it was, it was uh, um, only a couple months. Uh, it, it was it was not a super long process. Um, IAD Group did such an incredible job of of doing a good amount of diligence pre-term sheet, and then post-term sheet. They had a really really efficient process on how we can get through the uh, the uh, the due diligence that they had uh, left outstanding, and then we went into definitive agreements very quickly after that. So. Um, so if there's any advice that I'd give to any entrepreneurs, it's, you know, um, before the term sheet, before you sign the term sheet, ask about um, what the diligence process is going to look like uh, post-term sheet. Um, we fortunately were able to find just such a great capital provider that, um, that had a really efficient process and, and they knew what they were doing. They've certainly done this before. 
And uh, because of that expertise that they had, it allowed it to be uh, probably a quicker process than, than uh, maybe others would experience. No. Well, it sounds like it was a great experience for you. In, anything you would have done differently look, looking back? It's it's so hard to, uh, to think of things to do different because I'm so proud of where we're at today. And I'm so proud of where we're heading, uh, um, going in the future, you know? So there's there's always things that like, um, that like as an entrepreneur, you think like, gosh, I could have done that or I could have done this. Nobody is perfect. And it's always funny. You get to see the headlines of what we've done at Society Brands, raising over $200 million. That's exciting, right? And and you almost kind of look like an expert after you do it, right? But like the truth of the matter is, is um, there's there's a lot of things along the way that um, that we took as learning experiences and said like, hey, we could do this differently the next time. Or, you know, nobody does anything perfect. So I think it's important to be transparent with yourself, but also as long as you never ever give up on what you're you're going for, I think that you should eventually get to where you want to be. Um, I think that the biggest thing that I personally did and many of our uh, team members and co-founders did is we committed to having society brands be a success regardless of how long it took. So the fact that um, early indications, which raising that $200 million was a huge success for us, but now that's just really phase one, right? And now we're putting the capital to work and, and we're, um, we're having a lot of fun. Um, we're, we're having a lot of fun doing that. So again, just be transparent with yourself. Never give up on that vision that you have. If it was true when you first thought it, about it, don't think it's going to be super easy all the way through. And, and just always try to find ways to get better. Well, Michael, I've certainly enjoyed learning more about your, your deal and, and I wish society brands and, and your entire team continue success as you, as you roll out this, this really interesting strategy. Great. Well, thanks so much, Michael. I appreciate you having me. And uh, again, love everything that DealMakers is doing. Thanks.